Crime Broads with Crystal and Renee. Like this show and want to make your own? Let me tell you about Anchor. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Now you can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create, whether it's music analysis, your own radio show, or something the world's never heard before. One of the things I like most about Anchor is they distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Hello, welcome to True Crime Broads. This is Crystal. And Renee. And we are super excited about our guest tonight. We have the amazing Renee Jones on. And many of you who have been following the Missy Beavers case have probably seen her in some of their interviews over the years. She was a really close friend of Missy's and she was also her uh, the person who trained her how to do her job at Camp Gladiator. So she was a Camp Gladiator trainer herself. And then she moved up to regional director and she was actually over Missy and was responsible for, you know, teaching Missy how to do her job. So that's exciting, isn't it, Renee? I can't wait. Uh, absolutely. I'm so excited to have her on. Yeah, she was so gracious to come on and spend time with us. Um, I thought before we uh, get this party started with Renee, we would just go ahead and read a review. We got a wonderful five-star review from a listener. Her name is Rachel Linder. And that's cool that she used her actual name. A lot of times it's just like a handle or something. So that's cool. Yeah. And the title of it is wonderful. Five stars. And she says, thank you to so much for keeping Missy at the forefront of people's minds with this podcast. Love hearing about the case and the episodes talking about other cases are so good to listen to as well. Keep on keeping on. So that was very nice. We appreciate oh, you guys. Nice. We really appreciate you guys listening. And then the people that take the time to leave us a nice review, that's just even better. We appreciate it so much. It helps us, helps fuel us to keep going. And so without further ado, here is our interview with Renee Jones. We're so excited to have Renee Jones on our episode today. Renee Jones was a close friend and confidant of Missy's, in addition to being her boss at Camp Gladiator. Renee actually taught Missy how to do her job as a Camp Gladiator trainer. And we just couldn't be happier to have Renee here. She has a unique perspective on the case, on Missy, on the community. And Renee, welcome to True Crime Broads. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm glad yeah. to join you guys. Yes, thank you so much. And we were just kind of wanting to start off maybe by asking you, what's it been like to be there in the community and have, you have a really close connection to the case. I mean, what, you know, how, I mean, you're very close to the community. You're well known in Ellis County. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and just sort of how this case has affected your life? I started, well, I don't even know where to start, but I started training probably um, 20, 23 years ago. I was already training for ten, about 10 years before Camp Gladiator reached out to me and asked me to launch Ellis County. So for probably, man, two or three years, I was the only trainer from Dallas to Hill County. Um, literally, I was the only trainer running boot camps in that widespread wow. uh, range. And so one of the ultimate goals for me was to find trainers that had a passion to do what we do, that loved people and that wanted to impact as many lives as they could. And it's really hard to do that when you're a trainer, because unfortunately, in a lot of cases, which is why I was so attracted to Camp Gladiator, in a lot of cases, trainers end up competing, um, especially in a gym setting with other trainers. Um, right. And it's, it's just not a healthy, it's not a healthy vibe. And so Camp Gladiator's mission to impact as many lives as possible was huge because it was a win-win for everybody. The goal is you, you find a trainer um, that has a heart and a passion that's genuine, um, that loves community, that really wants to reach outside the box, outside the four walls in a gym, 
and you introduce them to this awesome opportunity and they don't uh, the trainers that you're, you're speaking to and that you're recruiting and you're talking to they don't have to give up what they're currently doing this was kind of camp glider is kind of um in addition to it's like the icing on the cake for for someone who really wants to get outside and for some for some people their comfort zone in a gym setting but for others just really being able to see true fitness and and how overall health impacts so many people and it doesn't have to start and end on a bench press machine um, one of the things that I absolutely loved about Camp Gladiator, and I still love them, I say love because most of you guys know I retired about two and a half years ago, but one of the things I loved about them is we were able to literally teach people how to live a healthy lifestyle for the rest of, rest of their life without ever needing a trainer or a piece of gym equipment. We're teaching them your, the weather your excuses for bad weather, it's invalid. The excuses of I can't afford a trainer, it's invalid. We literally were teaching people how to become healthy and fit literally from their house if that's what they had to do. Um, so it was, it was a pretty amazing program. With that vision, it was very easy for a trainer like me that had been training for so long to be so hungry to share that passion that we just wanted to tell everybody. I, I used to call it throwing up at the mouth. If one trainer said, hey, I heard you started Camp Gladiator in Ellis County, what's it like? It, it was kind of like they invited me over for a three hour session because that's the amount of time I'm gonna give them. So Missy was recruited uh, by me, by someone in our community. Uh, she reached out to me and she said, Renee, there's this there's new trainer. She's been training at a gym. She's a really good friend of mine. And I know that she could really make a difference if you could reach out to her and you kind of took her under your wing. Um, it, it was very, I'll be honest, I took it as a compliment. It was very sweet. She reached out and said she would grow and prosper with you. Right. And so I reached out to Missy. Um, I want to say it was probably late February, 2015. Um, a lot of the photos that you see revealed in the media were actually taken at my house and in my backyard and at my kitchen table. And in fact, the, the photo of her signing a piece of paper was her signing a contract on March 27th, 2015 at my house. Interesting. Okay. And yeah, I knew you guys were, I was, you answered my question. I was going to ask how you and Missy met, but it was through a mutual friend who yeah. connected you for training. Okay. Excellent. Absolutely. I reached out to Missy um, and just of course fell in love with her. She was so stinking sweet. And uh, to be honest, our personalities were so different in that I am very vocal and outgoing and had a reputation of no excuses. Everything's invalid. You just suck it up buttercup and do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And she was so sweet and kind. And she made me smile a lot because we were so different, but she, um, you know, she started training with me, um, in, as an intern. And when I say training with me, she just kind of started the process and the internship for Camp Gladiator during that time, mind you, it may have changed at this point during that time was more of, let's see if you, uh, are a fit for the CG brand and, and let's see if the CG brand is a fit for you and vice versa. So during the internship process, we spent a lot of time getting to know the trainers, their families, what they valued the most. Um, we would even, or I would uh, look at their Facebook pages. Who, who are they? Um, do they represent um, the community well? Are they, are they loving, are they kind? And so obviously Missy fit all of those things initially she was extremely excited um, about trying something new she had been training at a at a couple of gyms but she hadn't been training very long she did express to me some previous endeavors that she had like a jean a blue jean company um, and i think thrive um, was one of them and i just knew that if she was used to speaking to that many people or speaking to people often or to open it up to sharing her story, her weight loss story, then I knew that she would be a great fit for Camp Gladiator. Once we started literally listing out the needs of the community, the needs of Ellis County, she kind of got a little nervous. Um, she was like, well, you know what? And, and please understand, oh my gosh, please hear my heart when I say this. I loved, loved, loved this about her. She said, I want to do this really bad but I need to make sure it aligns with my family and my husband. And that was huge for me um, because I, as you guys know, have a family, a beautiful family. And I honestly, for so many years and for so long have, have just really, I was so driven to helping people 
that sometimes when you're looking out and you see the needs of people and people are texting your phone 24 seven and you're trying to um, you're trying to help trainers grow and you're writing workouts for people and you're sharing your ideas and you're giving advice and you've got campers sitting at a restaurant at 11 30 p.m going hey here's the menu what do i do now you know i'm so used to pouring outside the four walls of which i slept in and and valued the most that missy showed me the opposite she was the complete opposite you know she didn't jump in and say which way do i go send me and i'll go she jumped in and said okay i need to talk this over with brandon i need to make sure this is a fit for my family um in addition to that it, it went a little step further which is pretty awesome um she had some trouble explaining how some of the things worked with brandon and she called me and she said hey can you explain to brandon i was like absolutely invite him over for dinner and so we had uh, missy and brandon over at our house for dinner and it really gave us an opportunity to share um share why we believed in camp gladiator and share why I didn't mind sleeping three hours a night and getting up at 3 a.m. and going to bed at midnight was not, it wasn't a burden. It was a blessing during that time in my life. Um, and, you know, I've always told people, people don't buy what you sell. They buy your passion and um, they buy what you love and, and why you do it. And so that really gave me an opportunity not to sell Brandon, not to sell Missy, but to say, guys, this is, this is life changing. And th these people in the community need you. And there was a need and there still is a need every day, as you guys know, just for health and fitness. I mean, right. I think America is like the most obese country in, in the world. And so um, being able to share that with, with her and Brandon and know that the impact that she's making is huge. I mean, it's, it's like my ministry at church. It's being a part of something way much bigger than yourself, which allows you to impact more and more and more and more. So that's fantastic. Okay. Well, hey, uh, Renee, um, my co-host Renee met Missy through Selling Jeans. So that was interesting that you brought that up. Renee, did you want to tell us about that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I actually met Missy in, I think it was 2014. It may have been the end of 2013 because we worked through the whole entire year of 2014 together. Um, I had um, joined um, Vault Denim and um, she was one of the uh, inventory um, people that, that had the inventory to get so you could have jeans parties and so forth. So there was two of them. It was um, another one in Waxahachie, another lady, and then Missy. So I, I got to go over there and, and, you know, chat with her. And you are so right when you say she was just so sweet. She was so humble. And I've probably said this a thousand times, but she really was. She was just so sweet and kind and caring and um, she just always made you feel good about yourself. So I really enjoyed it. And she tried to recruit me to to go with her to do the the exercise thing, but I was a little intimidated. But yeah, I met her doing the vault denim jeans. It was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, small world. Um, so Renee Jones, um sorry I'm using your last name, but I didn't want Renee, my co-host, to think I met her. Um, Renee, is there anything about the investigation so far that you you kind of want to comment on like has is there anything about it that you may might think me needs more attention or is it hard to tell from kind of you know from our vantage point from your vantage point what do you think is going on there is it possible to tell how the investigation is going sorry i know it's a bit of an awkward question i i guess just what do you think about the way this case is going because it's been over five years now so of course people's different opinions, people's theories. There's all sorts of wacko theories. There's theories that kind of make sense. There's, but nobody knows what happened to Missy. So what do you think? I mean, what, what do you think about this just being such a total mystery five years later, I guess is a better way to word that. I was about to say that your initial, your initial question could have went in so many directions. I was about <laughs> to start throwing up out the mouth, but now you've given me a little bit of directive. Um, you know, I like everyone else in the community, um, specifically Missy's family. Um, I'm frustrated. Um, I'm agitated. Uh, for a long while, I was extremely angry. Um, I, I can remember, oh, wow, I can remember leaving a, a boot camp literally weeks, months, several months after, uh, after Missy's death. And 
literally just hitting the steering wheel on my boot camp truck going, okay, Missy, this is it. Like I was yelling at her saying, you're the only one that knows. You need to give us some direction because we're all dying here. We're not sleeping. We're tired. Give us some direction already. And I remember just that just became like a regular thing. If I left boot camp and I was frustrated or, or someone would ask me a question or a police officer or investigator would ask me about the case and I felt like we were spinning wheels, I would literally just scream at her while I'm driving, you know, as if she's in my car that can hear me. Um, but to say all that is it's an emotional roller coaster for one, mm-hmm. um, even from the beginning of the investigation. And for the first probably two years, I would say it's really frustrating for people like me um, that, and there are so many people that are in our community, mind you, that knew her a lot better than I did, a lot more, a lot for a long term period. Um, but even for me to hear people feel like, or to say, or to vocalize, you know, they don't care or nobody's trying or everybody's silenced or nobody's wanting to speak up. And the truth of the matter is in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of trial and tribulation, you really don't know what you should be saying. And especially when there's nothing that's been solved. So you, you kind of take some of the things that you know, and that you feel, even you take your emotion, your action and your knowledge and your experience, and you roll it all into one ball and you pass it on over to an investigator at the MPD. And all you can do is hope they have the time and the heart and, and they do their job and they pick it apart um, enough to where you know that what you gave them was viable enough to, to make a difference. And far too often these the past five years, I don't think people see that from the outside as much as we would like them to. Right. Um, it, it's not that we don't care. Believe me, I'm sitting here right now I don't have you guys on camera, but I'm sitting here right now with three huge file folders and every one of them says Missy B on top of it. Um, and they're just file folders of me just researching silently in the background or speaking with people silently in the background. Um, I've, I've never been on any of the Facebook pages for a reason. Um, and to be honest, that reason is because a lot of the things that are said or a lot of the things that people say, this is fact and I know it when I know for a matter of fact that it isn't, it touches home and I take it personal. So um, to to keep myself at a place where I'm happy about who I am, I choose not to be involved in those groups. Now, you two ladies have done a phenomenal job literally bringing the facts to the surface and getting rid of the negativity. I, I've told everybody, you know, the more negativity that you allow to feed into your brain, it's like feeding a hungry lion. You can't grow out of the bubble of negativity. And the problem with that is, you never actually get to the top to see actually the the big picture. Um, One of the things I tell my employees here and and the engineers here is when, if I ask you for something and you don't understand what I'm really asking, ask me to paint what done looks like so that you get a clear definition before you waste your time on it. And I feel like no one has ever said, okay, let me let me get the whole picture. Let me get this vision board. Let me put it all up there before I speak. And then let me see what are the facts and what is probably not so much factual. It's just someone that's really gotten obsessed with the case and they want to help out so bad that they start creating these stories. Um, The stories impact people in a very negative way, especially I've seen four or five, six families, not that I've seen that, that I've heard, um, have been destroyed because of rumors and gossip of things that never happened or never occurred. Right. And it's easy. You know, we're, we're humans. It's we were all born with this instant gratification where we just want to know and we want to be a part of it. We want it to, to be over with. But the truth of the matter is you have to kind of think like the investigators when you're trying to do this stuff. You've got to sit back and say, OK, what does the big picture look like? And, and even if you take all the balls and say, what makes sense, you put them on the left and you take everything that does make sense, doesn't make sense or whatever, and you put it on the right. Sometimes the stuff that looks like it makes perfectly good sense has zero value because the honest truth is a lot of the stuff that makes sense is coming from research or comments on the web. Um, so I say all that to say it's been challenging. Uh, people are working. Um, I wish I could do more, but like you two, there's not enough. You can only get what you can get. And then you hit, you literally hit a dead end. Um, you, you really do. You hit a dead end going, okay, wait, I just took this whole maze to get here. 
and I'm either you feel like you can't go anymore, there's nothing to dig for, or you feel like you've just been looped right back around to the very beginning. Um, I do have my opinions um, about the investigation and I'll be open with most of them. One of them is I do believe that the scene was, was opened up way too soon. I don't feel that um, there was adequate amount of time for someone of a high caliber and education and knowledge that, that just like what they do to come in and do enough due diligence to, to just make a decision to clear the scene. I, my mind tells me, again, I'm not the professional, my, my mind tells me if I go in once, I go in twice, my buddy goes in, we can't find anything, let's go take a break and come back in the morning. But the fact that the scene was immediately opened, yeah. I don't know that there was anything there. How could I? But I can honestly say that my gut tells me, man, if we only had a little bit longer, could we have found something? That building was large. Was there something else that was there that we missed? That's a good point. Uh, very good. I, I just, the other thing is the Ultima, you know, um, does it have, is it linked to the murder? Is it not? I'm a person of gut and God has call it a blessing, call it a curse. But my friends know me in this way that I do have at times a strong gift of discernment and I, something tells me that Ultima is connected to it. Again, I don't know. I don't know that. What I don't understand is why the Ultima has not been able to be located at this right. point in time. Maybe it can't, it could be at the bottom of the ocean, but during that time, I don't understand um, and of course, we don't have an opportunity to sit down with the people that looked at the license plate and that picked the video apart, but I don't understand why there wasn't something there um, that was researchable, something that was, that gave an outlook of, even if it's 2000, you know, if somebody said, I've got 2000 Altimas, I'm going to go through every single one, it doesn't matter. Um, the next thing I don't understand is why the silence and why so long? Um, I get that investigators, detectives, police departments, that all these personnel that are involved in this, this situation, I get that um, there are certain things that they have to withhold. I also understand and acknowledge that they are probably inundated with tips that don't make a difference, um, tips that are from people that have no idea what we're looking for. And I, I realize that they have to pick through those like a needle in a haystack every time they come in. However, I don't understand why there wasn't someone knocking on the door the next day and why that knock is still not happening. Um, I feel like someone should come in and get to know everyone involved, um, even if it's nothing more than spend twice a week reconnecting, knocking on the same door. Because I got to tell you, you can ask me a thousand questions about Missy's life, um, and I'm going to do my best to remember them all. But chances are, if you walk away and come ask me again, I'm going to remember something else to tell you. Um, Absolutely. We couldn't so agree more. My, my mind, my mind goes all over the place. But, um, you know, I hear, I've heard stuff. Uh, oh, Missy did this because it was a rule in Camp Gladiator. No, it wasn't. I don't know where that came from. I've heard, I've heard people. And when I say I've heard, um, this is me not being on social media. This is me like, you have no idea how many private messages I received on Facebook after this happened. Um, people would message me and say, oh, it has something to do with the Bucky's beaver sitting out the Bucky's because all the Camp Gladiator trainers are taking a picture in front of it. I'm like, dude, no, we do that because that's the middle point for us to go to the restroom and grab an energy drink on our way to training in Austin on the football field. Right, so right. There's just so many things that I just want to reach out and say, no, that's not right. No, that has nothing to do with it. No, your focus is in the wrong area. Um, and so I don't know. And, and then the rumors, I, you know, life happens. Um, that bugs me. The, the, the constant comments, and I have to say constant comments because sometimes people are commenting, um, then they're making the same comment over and over but they haven't taken the time time to actually research the case and research the life because I'm constantly, you know, I used to, I used to, excuse me, you guys, I used to constantly read the same thing. Oh, it was because it, she had an affair. It's an ex lover. She had an affair. It's an ex lover. You guys dig into the case. Number one, if she was having an affair, which I'm not going to disclose what I know, she and I had a personal relationship, but if let's just say that she was, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? 
right constantly. We're, we're trying to find justice that's not even something to bring up um if you want to take it to the investigator sure but you can't because it's not really factual you're going off of rumors because when somebody's murdered the first thing people do in society because we're human i do it too i'm not i'm not going to say that i'm any different but the first thing that we do is say were they having an affair i mean that's <laughs> that's the question right um mm -hmm. but once there's so much more data out there and there are at least some facts to look at why not be open-minded and look at other things because the truth of the matter is we're just trying to bring justice and we we're trying to bring justice for missy for her family both sides of her family um and for the community i mean come on um so just i just it's just frustrating you know yeah. <laughs> because you you want to start i cannot tell you how many times i'm like i just want to start a facebook page that says the true story of missy beavers <laughs> Right. The true story of Camp Gladiator. And you would have to make it to where no one could comment or post because that would get derailed yes. so fast. Yes. <laughs> like, I'm, like, I'm going to be selfish right now. And I can because the truth of the matter is, it's truly interesting people are never universally liked. Okay. But I want to tell everybody what the facts are. And then I just want to keep you from saying anything back. So every time I have more facts, I'm just going to feed it to you. But you're not allowed to comment. <laughs> so that's so funny. Honestly, that would so be the funny. best group ever. Right. It <laughs> um, really would. So, um, you know, Cheryl McCollum was on our show a while back and she said that she thinks that the perpetrator is, uh, is listening and consuming material on this case just constantly and, and more than likely is listening to this podcast. Um, do you have anything that you would like to say to the perpetrator? No, if, if they are, I, I mean, if they're not, I hope they are, to be honest, because I, I believe that God works in mysterious ways. And um, it's my personal belief that if a person hears enough of, of um, maybe the crime they committed or the sin they committed, or if it's in front of them enough and they realize the, the magnitude and the volume of what's been done and, and they realize it's never gonna be dropped, hoping it just stirs something up in their heart, you know? Right. Um, because I have to tell you, there's no one in their right mind that would have done something like this to anyone. It could be your worst, Missy could be your worst enemy, which I guarantee you it's, she's not. I'm very doubtful of that, but she could be your worst enemy. Um, but for a person to do what they did, they were absolutely not in their right mind. And if they're in their right mind, then they're a very ill person that needs a lot of help. So at the end of the day, I feel like the more that person hears, I don't want them to hide. I don't want them to, not hear how we feel about it. I don't want them to ever think for a single second that we're not thinking, we're not searching, we're not looking, we're not pushing forward, we're not, we're not driving because at the end of the day, we're going to continue to keep the trains running. And I feel like the more times they can hear that, the better off, the, the more, the okay. more, the more evil can turn good. So, you know what, if they're listening in, welcome to the podcast. I hope you listen to it tomorrow and the next day too. Do you think that um, this perpetrator is somebody who's known in the community and somebody that maybe you or the other Renee or any of you guys might have met before? You know, um, that's a that's a it's a trivia question because there are times when I want to say yes, times when I want to say no. Um, it really depends on what season I'm in with this thing and what I've looked at most recently, but today I'd have to say that I don't, I don't think it's somebody there. Um, mm -hmm. And the only reason I is because it's so that community is it's, it's kind of large to some people, but it's also really small. I don't really right. know how to explain it, but um, <laughs> I really believe that if that person exists and they have walked out of their house, apartment, whatever, in the past five years, they would have been seen and recognized. Um, but, but I say all that crystal, because you might ask me that same question again in three months. And I might say, mm, maybe that is so relatable. Yes. Um, Renee and I have changed our opinions on who the perpetrator is since the beginning and we could change our minds again. It's just been, mm -hmm. you know, of course we don't know who killed Missy. We wish we did, but you know what I mean? Just as far as leaning this way, leaning that way. There's just been a lot of change over the past five years and it's just really frustrating 
Um, and I agree with you. I wish that MPD would release some statements. The silence is, is frustrating. I think that the community deserves to know if you need to be keeping all your doors and windows locked and looking outside and keeping your exterior lights on. I mean, is there a homicidal maniac on the loose in your community? I mean, that's, that's a public safety situation. Absolutely. And, you know, it's so, when I think about Missy training, there's hundreds of trainers that do exactly what we've been doing every single morning, every single day. And, um, some of us are not as aware of our surroundings as others. Um, it's, you know, I, I've always told my clients, don't get comfortable. You know, you, you've got to live outside your comfort zone at all times. And I even say that in ministry, if, if you're so comfortable that you, you get laxed in uh, your Bible study or serving or whatever it is, then you haven't given God a chance to equip you to do much more. Don't get comfortable. Everything we do should make us a little bit nervous or anxious, if you will. And um, I, I think about the trainers and just, you know, I've watched Missy train for, for a while. And so I, I remember she would literally, God bless her. She's so sweet. She would just get out of her car and go like she was, her mission was to impact somebody's life or to tell Miss Susie that she's going to do five push-ups instead of four. Like she had already known, um, like some of the things that she was going to say to specific people, because those specific people had goals and Missy had a passion for helping them reach it. She was very intentional if that's the word. Um, and so she would just jump out of that truck you know, drop her tailgate and head to the door. Um, and I hate to say it, but now, I mean, it's good, but now since all this has happened, I do feel like more um, people that are too comfortable or naive or whatever you want to call it are, are starting to starting to look more at their surroundings and to kind of figure out things that don't look so, you know, not so right or, or whatnot. I know for myself after Missy's death, I had so many people, you guys, stalking my house. I had media hiding behind bushes. I had guys following me with cameras at the park, hiding behind trees. It was insane. And so I literally, um, literally would get to a building for my camps and I would circle the building twice with the flashlight in the dark. And I checked every door, every window. And I retired two and a half years ago and up until the very last day that I trained, I still did it every single workout, every single day. Um, if it was in an afternoon in the park and the sun was out um, and it wasn't dark, well, I would unload my truck and then I would walk the park. I wanted to know who was in it, what they were wearing. Um, I heard you guys talk. I don't even know when it was. I, I, I Pardon me, guys, and forgive me. I jump around in your podcast based on time or what the topic is, but I heard, um, I think I heard Renee the other day talking about um, carrying, a, a carrying a gun, um, concealed carrying. And I have to tell you, over the past five years, I bought every concealed, everything you can possibly imagine. Um, if somebody wants to try before they buy, it would be my house that you would want to come to because I have it all. I have leggings with holsters. I have vests with holsters. I have tank tops with holsters. Like I literally did nothing every workout i had somebody with me i monitored where i was at i was very intentional on what people were wearing what car they were driving what it looked like if the car drove around twice instead of once i noticed car. um i just and I'm, I'm hoping that more and more people are doing that now mm -hmm. um, but missy was one of those people that was just so in love and passionate for the people that she was on a mission when she yeah. pulled up into that parking lot, she was on a mission. And one of the things that I've heard people talk about a lot is, could we go inside without anybody with us? The answer is yes. Um, what time are we supposed to be there? Um, the general rule of thumb, in fact, the first thing they're told by leadership at Camp Gladiator is you're on site an hour before camp ever starts. Um, small communities, you don't really think about it. You know, you've lived right. there, you know, everybody. Okay, well, that's what we'll do. I mean, I did it for seven, eight years before Missy, you know, um, was even brought on. And that's just what I did. Didn't think anything of it. I was alert. Um, I, I wouldn't park in a parking lot, for example, if, 
if I see two cars parked in the parking lot. Not until I called and had them checked out or not until I drove next to them with my flashlight. I wanted to see if the cars were empty, if they were locked, if they'd been there all night. That was kind of the norm for me. But after um, Missy's death, it went to a whole new level. Now, with that said, the community, uh, huge props to Ellis County PD. And when I say Ellis County PD, I mean all the interim cities. Like, literally, if they knew we were running to boot camp, they'd come say hi to us. Um, I had Walks Hatchie PD come check on me. Hey, Renee, everything good? Yeah, it is. Thanks so much for checking. Oh, that's fantastic. Great. It yeah. was awesome. They would they would ride through a few times before they head out, and then they'd come back when they knew that I was shutting down. Same thing in Ovilla. Um, I was training in Ovilla. The Ovilla PD would come by. Oh, man, one of the, um, I don't know, what's maybe, I can't remember his job title, but one of the uh, Ovilla police officers, he would come to my boot camp in Ovilla and bring me coffee while I'm setting up. Oh, that's great. Wow. So to see the love um, and to know that the, the Ellis County Police Department, no matter what, what segment, no matter what city they're in, they truly cared, you know, that's great. Um, and that was assurance and security that, you know, whatever happened in the case, whatever they missed, um, things like what I'm saying is, you know, not, not sh opening a scene so soon and whatnot to the public, that kind of stuff, whatever they missed, it was either lack of experience or just um, not knowing it's new. It was something they didn't have, you know, they've never experienced before, but it doesn't take away from the love that we have felt since that day. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. that was awesome. Um, it really is. I have kind of some technical questions about Camp Gladiator. There's been some discussion over the years where there's been a debate about this and I'll tell you what I think is the right answer and I may be wrong, but would Missy or any other trainer be paid more if they had more people in their class? My, I just assume that's the case, but I've had people tell me it's not. Wouldn't, if you have a bigger following and more people attending your classes, doesn't that generate more income for the trainer? Yes, but no. Yes, okay. but no. There's a lot of detail to that. And um, please understand today, I have no idea. I retired right. two and a half years ago, and it's my understanding that a lot has changed since I've left. Okay. Um, but trainers grow by growing one another. So I'll give you a scenario. Let's say, Crystal, you are a new trainer that I'm bringing on. And the reason why we would bring on a new trainer, by the way, is because of volume. For example, I was the only trainer between Dallas, and I think I told you guys that, for like two, three years. So I cannot impact the amount of lives that I need to. Um, and at some point, I had to sleep. Right. And so I would run a 5 a.m. boot camp at my church, the Avenue Church, and have 73 people show up at 5 a.m. It, wow. like, it was like Friday Night Lights. And although that's exciting and it, it just really changed the atmosphere and the environment, the truth of the matter is at the end of the day, Camp Gladiator trainers are certified personal trainers or were, I don't know the story today, but, um, so it's very important to us that people come, they have a good time that no one has to keep up with the other. Um, a lot of people use the term modification. Some of us use success option, knowing that I can give a success option to 73 people because they can't or are incapable of doing a straight solid push up on their toes. One time spoke value, spoke volumes to the value and into the knowledge that we were giving, you know, given and the attention, the attention that we're given to each individual. So if I have 73 people at a boot camp, it's time to find another trainer. So that's when we would go out and say, okay, we've got to get some more trainers so we can turn this 73 people into four groups, you know, or three groups. Let's lessen the load and spend more, more time and more personal intention with each and every one in, in the field. So I would recruit Crystal. I would help you, Crystal get going. I would teach her the way. I would mentor her. So in some cases, uh, Crystal may have been a personal trainer and has never uh, been a fitness instructor, if you will, or a coach um, to a lot of people at one time. Well, if you've never trained outside one-on-one -on -one training in a gym setting, it is a huge difference to going to motivating and empowering 70 people with the sound of your voice. 
Right. Uh, That's a different skill set for sure. Yeah, completely different. And so as a director, I would uh, train Crystal, mentor her. Um, she'd go to an audition because we want to make sure that that there are some really valuable non-negotiable things that Crystal had that uh, would help us spread our passion and vision for fitness. And if those were there, but there were a few other things that weren't, well, okay, well, those few things I can coach. I'm willing to invest my time into Crystal. And that's kind of, that's how kind of like Missy and I were, you know, and that's why we spent so much time together. We spent so much time together, not because I knew her before and we were great friends, but because man, if I could take her heart and her love and her passion and multiply it by a hundred, I mean, you're talking literally a game changer for the fitness industry. So I would take the crystal or the Missy and, and bring them out to my field, say, okay, you got, you guys, um, I'd say you need to come to one of my workouts this week or two or three. So I would give her the choice. Here's my schedule. You'd show up as a camper, as we called it, a client, and you'd work out in my workout so that you can feel what it should feel like to love Camp Gladiator and to be a camper. And then afterwards, we sit on my tailgate. I called it tailgate talk. I'd say, hey, Crystal, what do you think about being a camper? Did you love being here today? What was the environment like? You being a first-time client, so to speak, what did you feel like when your car pulled into the parking lot? Were you nervous? Were you anxious? The idea behind that is to get Crystal to feel what it's like to be a person arriving at a Camp Glider boot camp for the very first time, um, to feel what it's like to be intimidated, to feel like I'm alone or to feel like I'm nervous. I had so many people that would take a first lap and then run to their car to leave. And I, my husband would hunt them down and bring them back. Because <laughs> wow. <laughs> at the Avenue Church, it can be a scary thing, especially when you pull up and there's 70 people, not three. Um, it can be very scary. So we, we, we do that. And then, then I'll say, okay, Crystal, how about, um, Wednesday, I'm working on in Wednesday's an endurance day. How would you like to train 10 minutes of my workout so that I can see how you do? Absolutely. So Crystal comes out and she trains for 10 minutes. I give her some feedback and then I start preparing Crystal for an audition of which myself and some other trainers would judge. And that's where we kind of say, oh, she has great form, great technique. She understands the Camp Gladiator way. She's a great fit, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then of course we take those things that we feel like we can improve on, which is we try to say 33. So there's three great things of crystal that we never want to change. She's killing it. We need to duplicate that. Then there's three areas of improvement um, that maybe we can improve on to make her not a great, a good trainer, but a great trainer for camp gladiator. Doesn't mean she's not great. It just means as far as a camp gladiator vision and mission is. Um, so then I would invest my time. So then I would help Crystal find a great location, um, an approved location. I sometimes would call like if like at the church, I'd call the church and say, hey, we have a great trainer coming in. You know, we're really inundated with, with people that want to be healthy and fit. Do you think that we could use your facility? These are the times and days that we need. If we get a yes, I go back to Crystal and say, hey, I got you a spot. Are you ready? Let's go. And so I'll take her to the spot, we'll check it out. And then I teach her how to talk to people about the mission and vision of Camp Gladiator, how to pull people in. Now at that point, Crystal might be opening a location that's three miles from my location, okay? Well, if those three miles are away from my location, but that camp starts at the same time or 10 minutes earlier, I have to say, okay, how many of Renee Jones clients would pass Crystal's location that we're trying to open to get to mine? So Crystal opening down the street is a benefit to me because my clients don't have to drive as far now. They can sleep 10 minutes later. Um, it's an advantage to Crystal because Crystal is not opening her business on day one with no clients. Right. She's opening with my clients, okay? Well, now my clients that stopped coming to my camp are now going to Crystal's because it's convenient and Crystal is awesome. Well, now those people that go to Crystal's camp are telling their neighbors who've never wanted to go to Renee's camp. One, Renee wears a bandana. She yells and she screams and she's intimidating. <laughs> True story. And two, now there's a camp closer to their house. 
So now my clients are working out at Crystal's location, but my clients are bringing in their friends and family members for Crystal. So Crystal gets to grow. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Yeah. So we're not, we're not paid by, we weren't back then paid by how many people show up. We are paid by growing our business. And we have this pact that is a be- very beautiful thing. Um, if I grow, you grow. So if I'm sitting at a HEB talking to um, Janice, who's checking me checking me out at the, the grocery line, and, I, and Janice says, oh, what does that CG mean? Oh, it's Camp Gladiator. My instinct, my natural instinct, um, completely unbiased and completely with heart and love is to say, Janice, you should try it out. Where do you live? Janice says, oh, I live in Middle Othian. Okay, great. Janice, obviously we're in Waxhatchee. I train in Waxhatchee, but I have a phenomenal co-trainer in Middle Othian. You, you've, you just got to meet her. What time of day would make sense for you to go check out a workout? And she'd tell me. I'd say, okay, great. So here's what I'm going to do. If you give me your phone number and email, I am going to introduce you or connect you with the trainer Middle Othian And we're going to give you one week free to go work out and check out our camp. Okay. And that's what we would do. And suddenly now that person that just checked me out in the grocery line is a potential client for Crystal, which is a potential life that Crystal gets to change. So, so to say that you get more by the amount of people, it's not so much true. Um, The idea is that you create a system to where everybody is helping everyone grow. Now, I'm not going to get anything for telling them, hey, Crystal, meet Janice. Hey, Janice, this is Crystal. This is a trainer I was telling you about. I can't wait for you guys to meet each other. Crystal, do you think you can tell Janice about your workouts this upcoming week? I'd really love for her to try it out. And then I'm out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's just what we believed. You know, scripture, I think it's Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpens iron as one person sharpens another. And that's what Camp Gladiator believed. I'm hoping they believe it today, but that's, that's what we teach. And that's what we mentor. And, you know, it's an abundance mentality. We're all in this together. In fact, if I could take that and get every trainer, (laughs) trainers that are connected and trainers that are not trainers that trainers that are at anytime fitness and trainers that are at gold's gym, could you imagine, like, could you seriously imagine if every trainer had the mentality as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another, what that would do to healthcare? Right. We wouldn't compete because we're all in it. And if I'm, if I'm, if I'm a, if I'm a spiritual minded person, I'm automatically going to know if I take care of that person, And that's my goal is to make a difference and to help somebody and to lend a hand. God is going to come back around. It may not be financially, but it always comes back around in one way or another. God might bless me with another trainer to help because he knows that's what I love to do is help trainers. So point being is it's really an amazing system. And that's probably Krista, one of the, one of the nerve buttons that was pushed earlier on in the case was. You know, I had people saying that I killed my friend, Missy, come on. Um, Their, their idea was that their idea was that Missy was so popular. I needed to take her out so that she wouldn't take my business. Just another ridiculous theory. Like, like people, you don't understand. That's not the way CG works. There's no CG trainer in their right mind that would want to get rid of another trainer. It's just as to them as it is to take out of here. (laughs) Well, and you hit the nail right on the head. I think that when this finally comes to light, we're going to see that it's someone who's not in their right mind. I mean, like (laughs) you said, nobody would even do this to their worst enemy, much less someone as sweet as Missy. So it's going to be a crazy person. It is. That's crazy. How many, um, on average, how many campers did Missy have, if you know? She was just starting. Um, I say just starting and it does take, it doesn't take everyone a year to grow their business. Um, but Missy was just starting in a way that, um, we had total transformation. We had a lot of campaigns that were going on that took her from one level to another. Um, but she would, I mean, 
we're talking 20 anywhere it presently like people that actually showed up she'd have anywhere from eight to 13 people on an evening camp um she'd have you know up to like 20 22 so it was never like overpowering she was in a she's in what i would call a really good sweet spot she had enough clients to pour into um enough clients that that set a good environment for energy a good energetic environment um and enough clients to really allow her to invest in each into each and every one that she hit the sweet spot and that's kind of the goal that's kind of the goal of finding more trainers is you find trainers that are training you know 10 to 20 people not one trainer that has to train 70 not that we have to we get to don't get me wrong but one person that manages and in, in 70 manages 73 people at one time it's amazing experience i mean i absolutely thrive in that environment um and I've been known to be able to know exactly what's happening out of every corner of my eye. And they're like, how did you know I was doing it wrong? I just know. But not everyone is like that. You know, some people need a focal point. And so most trainers, that's a sweet spot when you're running a boot camp and you're training alone, you know, because you can see 10 to 20 people at one time and you can fix them all and you can be social with all of them. And you can ask each and every one of them when they get to camp, how is your family? How was Sarah's basketball game last night? Because that's the thing is we truly wanted to be a part of their lives, a part of our community. You know, it's like our church. You, there's one thing to be in your community and have your building in your community. There's another thing to be a part of your community. And that's what we want to do as, as Camp Gladiator trainers is we want to get to know everybody, you know, just because we right. want to hear your story. We want to hear that, your story. And that's so lacking these days in society. We all have our faces on our phones and, you know, it's, that's just such a wonderful concept. And I hope to see more of that. And it's hard. I mean, I would even 73 people, I could jump around and I could be very intentional with what's happening, but I always had one problem and that's remembering everybody's name. Oh, and, that would be hard. And, and, you know, people's names are important. Um, their names are really important. And so the fact that, that Missy knew names, she, she knew what they did for a living. She knew that some of them needed to be at work a little earlier. So she would arrive a little earlier. Like that, that speaks volume to the investment that she made into her, into her clients, into her campers. It really does. I'm so glad you said that she would arrive earlier and allow some of the people to arrive earlier that needed to be at work earlier. You know, there was two ladies that were supposed to be there early to work out that morning that Missy was killed. And just by bizarre happenstance, they didn't go. One of them, um, we heard had a flat tire and her son had to come change her tire. So she ended up getting there at five instead of four 30, like she had originally planned. And then there was another lady who was supposed to also be there at 430. Uh, we call these the early arrivers, but you know, I don't know what you call them in Camp Gladiator, but we just gave them that name, the early arrivers. They worked out at 430 instead of five. And this second woman woke up, saw it was raining, was like, nah, I'm not, I'm not going in the rain. So what, I mean, it's really chilling to think of what outcome, how that could have changed the outcome of what happened. Isn't that phenomenal? Um, I think about that so, so often. I mean, right now it gives me chills. It does. Uh, it gives me chills to know that there are so many things that happened that morning that should not have happened on any ordinary day. And I get one thing not happening, but when your whole morning is in disarray at this point, at this particular moment, it just blows my ever loving mind. And, um, we do to, to speak to that we absolutely had um not all of us but some of us had a handful of of campers or clients that would say um i would love to work out with you i absolutely love the way you train my friend works out here the problem is i work in dallas and i have to get my kids ready for school because keep in mind camp gladiator isn't your typical it's not just a workout okay we, um, and I, what, what I'm about to say is, I wish I had the emails with me, but we changed lives. And when I say change lives, I had marriages that were saved, y'all. I'd have 
this one lady that would come work out so much and she was always away from her husband. She always, she always acted depressed or, and we don't know what people are going through. Okay. And that's one of the things I used to train. We used to tell the trainers, I would say, you guys, we have no idea. Once our friends, our campers, our clients get out of their car, we don't know what they're going through in life. We may be the only one hour of this entire week that brings joy or encouragement or energy or empowerment. So the fact that we don't know if someone just lost their dad last night, we don't know if somebody's having an affair, if somebody's getting a divorce, we don't know if somebody's grandmother's about to pass away. We don't know if somebody's just told that they're on the list to possibly lose their job. We don't know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. So part of the entire sculpture of the way Camp Gladiator was made was that we use that information that we know, okay, which is nothing. We know absolutely nothing about you. So I'm now going to be the best part of your day if it kills me. I have one hour to be the absolute best part of your day. So with that comes the personal relationships of saying, okay, hey, Crystal, you know what? I get it. I'm a mom too. I want you to get home in time to put your kids, get your kids dressed. And I don't want you to be late for work. I'll tell you what, I'm always here an hour early setting up camp. If you can manage to get here at 430, I'll have camp set up for you. I'll get you warmed up. Five o'clock rolls around. The group comes in. The five o'clock group comes in. I'll start them on the warm up. While they're warming up, I've already given you your workout. Cool. And that just makes all the difference of the world because now you're you're taking something that looks like a fitness membership or whatnot, and you're making it extremely personal and extremely valuable. And you know what? When they show up at 430 and you're the only one there and you've been there since four, man, that first set of headlights pulling in into a dark parking lot, it just gets you excited. Like you get fired up as a trainer because you know this person is investing into their time. Right. And if they're willing to invest, you're willing to pour into them everything you have. Now, you said there were some other things that morning besides the two early arrivers, as we call them, not showing up. What were some other things that morning that were a little bit different? Well, think um, everything. Brandon's out of town, right? Right. You know, I, I don't know if any, I've never heard anyone talk about it. I was out of town. That's, yeah, why that's, I called, true. that's why I called Fitz. I was out of town. And keep in mind, that was the first time I had taken a vacation in probably 15 years. And it wasn't a vacation. It was a three-day retreat because the VP of Camp Gladiator, one of them was really good friends with me. And he said, Renee, he said, you got to take a break. You are, you are going to burn out. He said, I don't care what you do. You've got to take a weekend off. And so I had planned a weekend off. I had another trainer cover all of my camps in Waxahachie. I had probably four or five new trainers training that morning for the very first time in their CG career. Okay. Um, I had another intern director that was tasked with filling in for me. Um, I just kind of said, hey, anyone that calls, if they have any problems, if their sound's not working, if their iPads aren't working, if they can't find their location. I said, I'm pushing them to you. He goes, I got you. Um, so then you pair that with the rain and somebody saying that a dark SUV left. How I'm like, how did that person not, you know, that that person wasn't revealed or that car wasn't revealed. And then the, the alarms didn't go off at the church and um, Missy's people didn't show up early. Like what else could possibly Right. coincidentally let this person get all free it doesn't make any sense but the truth of the matter is it's just I don't know I mean what do you call it it's pretty strange to me that's unbelievable yeah I think we did a whole podcast on that one time that all the things that that went right for the killer and wrong for Missy yeah and how does that even happen? I, I mean, know far too many coincidences that wouldn't happen on a normal basis right exactly you mentioned the alarms at the church did that did do you know that the church did have alarms and they just didn't work we know the surveillance cameras weren't working on the outside but what about the alarms that you mentioned i don't know um to be honest i don't have the, enough detail to go into that but it was my understanding that there's a security system there that involved surveillance and alarms but they didn't go off now it was also my understanding that the alarms in the in the back of the bill, I mean, the surveillance in the back of the building didn't work all the time anyway. 
um, which is another coincidence. Like, how does that person know to go through those doors? I mean, I could pick this thing apart. Um, you know, why did Missy leave her gun in the car? Like, I mean, there's like a thousand things that I can say that that one morning, everything just looked wrong and it was all coincident. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, you'd have to have 20 people to plan something like this. And exactly. Yep. Um, one of the things that our listeners ask us uh, have mentioned often and uh, are very curious about is we know that Missy went to the Cowboy Church and we know that she did her classes at Creekside Church and we know that um, the Avenue played a part in this as well. Can you tell our listeners about um, those three churches and what role they played in this whole scenario? The classes well, like and what she attended to actually go to church and so forth? Well, I'm not sure if I understand exactly what you're looking for, but I will say that she and Brandon periodically went to the Avenue Church. Um, They predominantly went to the Cowboy Church, and the only reason why is it's just preference. Missy loved the Avenue Church. She also loved the Cowboy Church, but she, I think the Avenue Church had a lot of our, our common people there, you know, campers, trainers, and things like that. It's just much larger. Brandon uh, loved the Cowboy Church, probably for the same reason, because it was smaller for him and the people that he knows and he was friends with went there. Um, Creekside was a location um, that we went after. We saw an opportunity to run a convenient location at a time of a morning that for what she thought was safe. I mean, there's nothing out there, but there's light. So, you know, what could go wrong there? So traffic. Um, so that's kind of how the three intertwined. Now at her memorial service of which the trainers did not go to um, because it was on a Wednesday night, I do know that the Avenue donated, and I, when I say donated, I use that term meaning vo- the volunteers donated their time. So the Avenue typically is reached out for security, events that require security here and there because they understand that the high level of security training that our guys have. Um, so I do know during that time, they did reach out to the Avenue and asked for some help with security during during that memorial service. I do know that. Right, that makes sense. And were there, did she ever attend classes there at the Avenue or having the classes at the Avenue or was that just yeah, uh, that was training with you? Yeah, that was my location. She'd come to okay. Waxahachie to uh, when I was training her to be a trainer. Okay, That's, that makes sense. Yeah, I remember you telling me that, but so um, did you never had classes at Creekside. So she basically was training under you at the Avenue and then she got her own location at Creekside. And we also have a lot of listeners that get confused about, they think that she must have attended Creekside, but Missy never attended Creekside. She attended Cowboy, was a member of Cowboy with her husband. And then they were starting to occasionally visit and attend avenue so we just kind of wanted to straighten that out because there's a lot of confusion surrounding the three churches and how they fit into all this i've never heard missy say that she visited creekside maybe she did yeah once twice but she's never she's never told me that she visited creekside in fact the week before she left I, i don't know if you remember me telling you this crystal but we did a huge event um a couple of weeks before she left so then The Friday she was leaving, the Sunday before the Friday that she left, um, I was sitting in church and I had texted her and said, hey, there's an amazing series on uh, family and marriage. I think you would love it. I said, you ought to say Brandon will will come. Um, And she texted me back and she goes, oh, I'd love to. Let me ask Brandon. She said, I know he's really enjoying going to the Cowboy Church, but I'm going to ask him. Um, And of course, the following Sunday, we, we know how, you know, how that went. She was coming back from Austin, but um, so I'll say that because, you know, they kind of visited both, but they were members at the Cowboy Church. So I know that Brandon really loved the Cowboy Church. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, that really helps. What are some of the things that, um, Missy would bring to set up for the Camp Gladiator classes? I know that, um, we've had a few Camp Gladiator trainers reach out to us and tell us a few things, but we figured you would be able to best tell us what, you know, you would bring to the to set up and and have for your class? I know exactly what Missy had. Um, Missy had her radio for music. She had her iPad for check-ins. 
because when people showed up, we'd check in. Um, if they were there just checking us out and not really a member yet, they signed a waiver using the iPad. Um, she had cones. She had send bills. Um, those were still in her truck afterwards. She had uh, a few dumbbells and she had some fitness bands. And on weight days on occasion, she would put um, more dumbbells in her truck and take those as well. Um, on occasion, she'd take bigger stuff, but on a day-to-day -day basis, that's exactly what was in her truck. I have a question sort of jumping around here. You know, it was publicized a lot in the media early on that Missy had gotten some creepy and strange quote unquote messages in LinkedIn from an anonymous source, obviously a fake account in a male's name, but they never released anything else besides what I just said. Um, did Cam Gladiator have some sort of a communication mechanism like let's say I'm just thinking man I'd like to lose some weight or get into shape feel better about myself is there a place I could get on the camp gladiator website and maybe shoot you or missy or somebody a message and just say hey I want to inquire about classes because you know so many people do everything online that they, they are too timid to make a phone call they would rather just shoot a message is there a way to contact you guys personally email address okay and it's like it's a camp gladiator email address or would it be your home yeah. email no, like mine was Renee at Camp Gladiator, Camp Gladiator .com for 10 years. How hard would it be for me to find that or for anyone to find you or Missy at the time or anyone else? N not hard at all, Crystal. In fact, my cell phone number is still out on the website, not on their okay. website, but out on out in the internet world, World Wide Web, if you call it, okay. uh, as an option for people to reach out to me, which is why so many leads um, the past five years have come to me. I'll get text, strange text messages. I get phone calls. I get, um, I get everything of people thinking, Hey, have you checked out this person? Some people give me their name. Some people don't. Um, and you know, I don't mind. It just gives me something more to, to research, to look into because it is like a needle in a haystack and I don't get nearly the volume that the police department gets, but the few that I get, I'm thinking, man, this is this takes work. You know, you have to look through from start to finish every single lead that you get. Um, luckily, some of us have resources to do that. But, you know, to as far as creepy messages, all of our names and our email addresses in a photo of us were on the Camp Glider website. Again, I don't know if it is today. Um, you could click an email. You could take that photo and hunt us down on any of our social media sites. We were encouraged to have Facebook, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, um, because essentially we were business owners. And it's if you want to grow, you've got to, you, have to you be know, available. right? There. Yeah, you've got to make some connection. Now, again, when I when I talk about the different personalities of people in general, you have people that that aren't as intentional as their of their environment. They're kind of naive, if you will. You have people like me that are OCD and I'm looking around and I want to know everything. So I cannot tell you how many messages we get on LinkedIn. We always have. I'd, I'd get Facebook messages all the time from creepers because I used to do uh, photo shoots and stuff for like a friend of mine that did um, big fitness. They're called epic photos where it looks like you're sweating, but you're really standing in water, but nobody knows. And you're doing kickboxing and weightlifting, all this stuff. I would do tug of war. And I would get a message that says, so babe, can you tell me who won tug of war? Uh -huh. text, you know, text me back. I, I don't give it time of day. In fact, I just hit delete. I don't text back and say, stop, don't bother me. I just hit delete. Um, in some instances, we'll get a message. And this happened often, you guys. This was often. Hey, I'm interested in your camp, but I'm too nervous to show up. Can you meet? And my answer was always the same. Sure can. 6.30 p.m. gets in your park and walks a hatchet. You'll see a red flag. You'll see a boot camp truck, a trailer, and about 70 people. Right. Grab one of them. Right. Sometimes wow. that's what you show. Now, because they're expecting me to meet them at a coffee shop. That's I'm not ridiculous. That. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You talk about stranger danger. That's ridiculous. And if so. People would even think that. But let me ask you this. Yeah. Was, did Missy ever receive a creepy and strange message on the Camp Gladiator email? Um, that I don't know. Um, I would, I could say it's possible because on our social media pages, we use our Camp Gladiator email address, especially directors. She wasn't a director, but director's email address is on everything, even trainer stuff. Um, but 
if someone pulled the email address off of a social media, let's say if they send a message on LinkedIn and we don't answer, they might send something to the Camp Gladiator email. Now yeah, that would be thinking that's that would be bold and brave, but but not that they're creepers, but I've gotten a few people that tried to meet with me outside my boot camp hours um, through email. They pulled my email address off the website and emailed me. And I told them exactly what to do. I asked them to meet me at my location and they never showed up. So, you know, I can't say that it was creepy because they never showed up. So I really don't know. They didn't right. contact me anymore. It could have been creepy. Who knows? So it, it's just hard. To, it's hard to say. Um, the world is, is, <laughs> We live in a fallen world, you guys, and in the internet and everything else can really, it can make a right turn left real quick. It, you got that right. That is for sure. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to maybe tell us about what your thoughts are on the case or where we're headed? Or do you feel encouraged that this thing is about to break wide open? Or, I mean, I, Renee and I don't know enough to have an opinion on that, but do you have any inkling or feelings that this thing's about to turn around? Um, I like to say my gut says it is, but honestly, I'm just, um, I don't know how to answer that question, Crystal. I, I hope it is. Um, I've spoken with a few of my sources um, and those sources believe that it's going to be solved before the year's up. Awesome. Now, I don't know. I don't know how they know that, but if they believe that, hey, I'm going to run with it because I would rather be on their side than to be discouraged every day and think that it's not, you know, absolutely. So I'm just going to keep a positive outlook and assume that it is good. Yes. I'm right there with you. And who knows the NPD probably has something that we don't know for them to be so silent. You know, maybe they have something that we, we don't know. And if they share it, it might ruin everything. So if that's right. the case, good for them for making me wait and, and sweat in my boots for five years, you know? Right. That's what I'm hoping to. Seriously. Well, Renee, we just cannot thank you enough for coming on True Crime Broads. Um, did we have anything else we wanted to ask her, Renee? Other Renee? <laughs> Renee Rodden? <Rodin. laughs> um, the only thing I can think about is the door. Oh, the door. That's huge. Why don't you take it away? Okay. One of the questions, one of the things that has really perplexed our mind in this, uh, in this case is, you know, the two early birds that came, then there was the new person that, that came to the, you know, to Camp Gladiator that day, um, and then waiting around, didn't know how to get in, and, you know, the new person didn't know what was going on because they were new. Um, then eventually people started showing up. I think one of the early birds had gotten there a little bit later because they had a tire problem. Uh, they get there and I guess they maybe they can see through the glass. Um, maybe they can, you know, see her legs or something. And so they like, we got to get in there. Something's wrong. Um, how did they get in the building? That has, we've always wondered this and we've asked and just never been able to find out. I have asked that same question, to be honest with you. I've not been given a direct answer. Um, I've got other questions that I know the answer to, but I couldn't get direct answers for either just to, to prove that, uh, the the facts but with that said it's my understanding that the doors that were actually entered were not um sufficient doors um and they were able to break into them that's what i've been told okay. um, i i tried to figure that out to be honest and i don't have any factual data to back it up but all i can do is relate it to the avenue church but at the same time the avenue church has a lot more um secure, you know, security features and a, a higher level of security, in my opinion, based on mm -hmm. what I've heard and learned. Um, so I can't really say that there's an extra button or there's a, there's a guard bar or anything like that, that we have at our church. But I can say if it's anything like the main doors and it was, that door was stable, there's no way they would have gotten in. Um, so something had to be wrong with that door. Or if anything, or possibly someone broke the glass and just unlocked it when they saw Missy Lang there, because that awesome. kind of, that kind of adrenaline can make you do something you wouldn't normally do, you know, well, and and concerned about someone. That and that, and the fact that, um, they could have had dumbbells in their car. Typically Wednesdays are not a weight workout in Camp Gladiator world, but if a trainer has odd camp days, they'll, they'll make it a dumbbell workout. And if anyone carried their dumbbells with their yoga mat up to that door, mm -hmm. I mean, you 
pick a 15 pound dumbbell, it's going to go through some glass. You right. know? Yes. Okay. We've just been wondering, because the story we heard is the campers were starting to accumulate as they showed up and they were very confused about why Missy's truck had the tailgate down. They saw her keys. She wasn't responding to texts or phone calls. They were all starting to trickle in one by one. And then um, they all decided that they were going to walk to the main doors. And when they got to the main doors, they could see Missy's legs and they could see that they were hoping that she had just fainted and they were trying to get over there to assist her. And once they got in, they could tell that, you know, something much worse had happened and Mm -hmm. that she, you know, was likely deceased, but we just never understood how they went from, we can't get in you know, when we don't understand where she is and the doors are locked to now they're suddenly performing CPR on her. That's always just been a big gap in the information, you know. Well, you have to, I I can't help but to think of a mental mindset, you know, to show up and know, because that whole scene you just described with the exception of finding Missy on the floor is a very common scenario of camp. Some trainer leaves their door open Usually they'll leave their keys if their hands are full, their tailgate is dropped, the radio is sitting on the tailgate and, and there's too much stuff to carry back and forth, right? So typically when you enter the church, um, you would, if you were alone, you would hop in and you'd let the door close behind you and it kind of locks you in, basically. It keeps people from coming back, you know, coming in behind you, basically. Um, I know of trainers for a long time, I'm praying that they don't do it anymore, but they'd prop the door open because they have so much stuff. Um, makes sense. Your hands are full, you know? Yeah. So when I think about the mindset of someone showing up to my camp, if they go to the door that I normally go into and it's locked, they're probably waiting for me to come unlock it. Um, they're not going to walk around the building in the dark, especially. Um, now if another camper and another camper shows up, one of them, I even have one in mind that would do it. One of them's going to say, well, let's check all the doors. But when you're just kind of thinking your trainer's running later in the restroom, you might check your phone. You might look down and tie your shoe while you're waiting. And then finally you realize, okay, nothing's happening. We need to go figure this out. So mm-hmm. my gut is telling me that they didn't check any other doors when they got there, just because that wasn't a common step to take when you arrive at that location. Oh, that makes sense. You know, right. I see what you're saying. That actually makes loads of sense. That would help explain it. I mean, I've had people text me and I've, I'm in a building or I'm at the trailer or I ran into the hospital across the street to get some water for somebody and they're still there um, because they know that I'm coming just because they're used to me either opening it a couple of minutes late or just, you know, there's just so many different scenarios when you, right. when you do that every day. It's a part of your life. You get right. comfortable. And just, yeah, that's just it. It's so routine. I'm sure that Missy Mm -hmm. was just comfortable and she knew where she was. And for heaven's sake, in a church, you would think that that would be the place you could feel the most safe in the whole world. It's just another level that makes this shocking, you know? And on the other side, you got to think about a psycho, somebody that's not in the right mind to them. That's the greatest place in the whole world, you know, because they know that that's a place where people feel secure. They feel loved. They feel comfortable. They feel welcomed, invited. Um, and what better place if you, if you are a violent person of that nature, I mean, what a better place to take advantage of somebody's right where someone just has their guard down. That's Mm -hmm. very true. Well, thank you so much, Renee. It was fantastic having you on. Please come back and see us anytime. If you think of anything, please let us know. We would love to assist in any way you can. If you think of anything we can do, we would love to. So please keep in touch with us. Yeah, we do appreciate it greatly. And thank you so much for being on True Crime Broads. Thanks, Renee. Guys.
goes back. Skirt off the block, black, black. 12 on the clock. I pay in cash. cash, cash. You do the math. Yeah, yeah. I watch the bag. Yeah, yeah. You shake the tab. Yeah, yeah. Mock out you fast. Yeah, yeah. You had a gas. Yeah, yeah. Skirt off the block, black, black. 12 on the clock. Yeah, yeah. I pay in cash. Yeah, yeah. You do the math. Yeah, yeah. I watch the bag. Yeah, yeah. You shake the tab. Yeah, yeah. Mock out you fast. Yeah, yeah. You had a gas. Yeah, yeah.